Lo cingi ji pasha na, sama masih na. Oh, those chairs are not except for you. Saving the film. Ah. Okay. I'll let you take some air. Oh, Gonda. So, now. Uh, some of the just there. I need to ring, uh, secure members in Lata. And the autonomy gets to laggy. Shun Yella. Uh, come to you. I need to come to the engine. I'm going to go to the engine. So just lay and welcome everyone to this youth talk with our honorable CEO, Mr. Bimbatering La. My name is Jom Young and I serve as the youth coordinator here at TCCC. First and foremost, I would like to welcome and thank CEO Bimbatering La for dedicating his time to speak directly with the Tibetan youth of Toronto. Thank you for recognizing the importance of youth engagement and actively fostering it. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to our distinguished guest, Dr. Namgi Chodubla, who is the representative of North America in the Office of Tibet. Today's youth talk provides us with a unique opportunity to engage with our Honorable Sikyong, to learn from his experiences, and to exchange ideas on how we can collectively shape a better tomorrow for Tibet. I encourage each of you to actively listen, take notes if you have to, and engage in this conversation. We have a dedicated time for a Q&A session, so if any questions come up during the talk, please save it for the end. So I hope you take what you learn from here and continue this dialogue with yourselves and one another. So let's open our minds and have an empowering discussion. Take it away. Samalo Puget, Gosurbe, and Ede Samalo Gosurbe. And Goman Sunang Yagi Puget, and would get many cans of Tarin Gomas and Go Bush, a chinish for Jay or Marta. And Puget Yam Dirwa and Paraparangi, Egypt, this this picture down Roa. Okay. Tatarin, uh, Nachidan, did you, Mazuta, Tananga, Sigon, Genki, there, Roa? Any Mazu Niela, the middle of Gamba. Pene su pengen zogi chale namri. Pemi dig zogi chale namri. En tandapadu nganzu chizo te is radada yagbo yonge de samolo zo di gyaorum chi tuji garin deni chungsha gyorwa. Gyaorum chi mena ani vision di yomare. Pugyang rinbu gi gongba shay di yomare. Tende mena nganzu shija zuya, lapta zuya, gongba zuya dige samolo yungu yomare. Tende mena Anggau pergi je lari gua, ane siapa pergi pasang malu pergi jam macam ni dek. Tangbo anggau cikong gua jengap jengap gua lalu ya. Senjoy lelai berkabla. His Holiness stepped on Indian soil on 31st March 1959. So since that time, ane kasure. Tak kangen cuma suju aje. Kian suji pergi tak kian suju lozoi mangan tapi na it's mostly your grandparents. Who were in India and Nepal or Bhutan? Uh, they went through a lot of difficulties. We were put up in two camps: one camp for the monks and nuns, another camp for the lay people in West Bengal and Assam area. And then slowly, slowly, we were moved because we were, you know, even though I told you this morning that the Tibetan language came from Pebeke di Kyaane Yombare de ine ngazu ke kapang bet kagarwa kyaal sulde ni. Jangan dengan tu kerja sih tu juga amal eh. Ani dengan tu pelik ya. Ani cik laksa dah dengan tu sihiran media sambal lah. Dengan tu we had no skill whatsoever. And a lot of our young people died because we were not used to Indian food and diet. So slowly, slowly Tibetans were put up in the foothills of Himalayas to work on the only thing we know was hard labour. So we. Your grandparents, my parents, they worked on road construction in the Himalayas. And slowly, slowly, Tibetans were resettled in compact communities like Balukupi, Hunsu, Kolegal, Manpat, Orissa, the Shijia Mangoyorwa, Tenzu Nalolia, and the Rimbe 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 Dushini, Nganzo Shijia Tzu, and the Lapta Tzu, Gombat Tzu, Dushche, and the Pebeke, 
ตาเดซุญญาซาเชตูเวเรเทมาโดเพเนกยอรุมชิชิบินันดุสัมบัลลาญาวรุมชิเงเลเนเรกยอรุมชิเจเลเนเรมิทิเกสชิเลยอตา
Jesuits, missionaries, Yishu Chuipenge, right? They, the Christian missionaries considered Tibet as the last frontier where Christianity could not penetrate. We were all Buddhists. And Tibet is surrounded by snow mountain ranges, so it's not possible for people to come into Tibet very easily. You have to climb up so many mountains and down valleys and up and down. So there were no motorable roads. You don't have aeroplanes those days. Uh, so it's very difficult to come into Tibet. That's also the reason why Tibet was protected by its uh, land uh, and its structure. Next slide, Dila. I read a lot of um, travelogues by those missionaries who came to Tibet. So now it's available in English. Those days it was not available in English. Because most of the missionaries wrote back when they came to Tibet. They wrote back to their churches in Italy and other countries in Europe. And those were in Latin. Did you Latin report Now Latin is being translated into English and we have access to people who have traveled to Tibet in the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century. Roof of the world. Roof of the world. Roof of the world. In the south you have the Himalayas. The Himalayas are the highest mountains in the world. In the west, you have the Karakoram mountain ranges. In the north, you have the Kunlun ranges. And in the east, there are so many mountain ranges. So Tibet is a land surrounded by snow mountain ranges. Tathanda, why do the westerners started calling Tibet the roof of the world? It's because of Tibet's altitude. The, the reason why they call Tibet the roof of the world is because the average altitude of Tibet, it's about 12,000 feet above sea level, or in terms of meter, it's about 3,700, 3,800 meters above sea level. So the last time I was in Japan, everywhere I go, I try to speak to students in universities. Um, right, so lately I've been covering a lot of universities. Um, in England, I covered uh, Oxford University, uh, Westminster University, Abaddon University, and Kazan Yejara, I attended, I spoke at the Wawik Economic Summit, that's the Wawik University. And in Yaganali, I started speaking to colleges in Bangalore, Mount Carmel's College, all girls college, one of the most respected or prestigious college in uh, women's college in South India. And then you also have St. Joseph's University, Ramaya University. I spoke in Bangalore in three universities. Last time I was in Colombia, I spoke at three universities in Colombia, five universities in Mexico, several universities in the United States. Now we have to cover more ground to reach out to younger generations who can understand Tibet more. Right? Because sometimes we believe that people know about us because of His Holiness' popularity. But then you realize that they don't know the basics about Tibet. Right? And we talk about a lot of higher things which doesn't make sense to people. So that is why we talk about the basics. Did you do Pegelia, the roof of the world? This is not a map written by hand. Uh, these are all satellite images. And then you can see how Tibet is high from the Bay of Bengal or from the Kanyakumari, from the Indian Ocean side. When you take picture of the plateau, then you, it, will, it rises by itself. Uh, the Tibetan plateau was formed because of the tectonic shift between the Gondwanas, which is the Indian plate, and the Eurasian plate. So the plate, even now, scientists say that Tibet Himalaya is growing by 10 millimeter every year. Tectonic shift these, all these places are very vulnerable to uh, natural disasters like earthquake and all that because the plates are still moving and it's still being formed. 
the roof of the world la guedi because of tibet's altitude right the next slide del tebina then today you will hear this is another map of how high tibet is sabdan tebina then another next slide de chebina die pyog altitude tere sabta rang thone satobo khaju yeme di and mil deshish da yago mendoa nie khonjol when i was in japan i spoke to students there and i asked them which is your highest mountain in japan kagre japan ritoshu mount fuji ra mount fuji la altitude khajis re singe kishti bi khonjola and khonjo 3700 meters 3800 meters lagudoa then i told them your highest mountain the highest mountain in japan or the highest mountain in new zealand called the mount cook which is almost the same altitude as mount fuji is like base camp in tibet ne phel phel kiran so ritoshu de nganjo ge mashu de cha de orda ra dine ya shine za go ore nganjo dine de samal that that gives them an imagination as to how high tibet is and why people call tibet the roof of the world The next slide na china digi the tibetan plateau ki permafrost re ra today tingsa jana gi khuryu cheri ba yorwa environmental scientists chinese environmental scientists call tibet the third pole the two other poles are north pole and south pole and why do they call tibet the third pole because tibet has the largest amount of glaciers and permafrost that feeds the 10 major rivers that flows into 10 different countries in east asia and southeast asia ra tin du digi sapta digi kharitung yorsna it shows the amount of glaciers and permafrost on tibet so it's compared to next to the north pole and south pole tibet has the largest amount of glaciers and permafrost Tigre and then the size of Tibet is almost equal to Nunavut here in Canada. Nunavut is about 2.2.5 million square kilometers kilometers and Tibet is also about 2.5 million square kilometers. And that's about 1/4 of China. Right? 10 times the size of UK. 18 times the size of Japan. Pe pe sada jachumbore. ra phe sa ja chungju dine marda pe ga chumbure because me chi nyama pakistan ge journalist ching a thusu khurang lagdo which is bigger bhutan or tibet and bhutan is so small ra tibet is very big din de sambala din so ge mi kha shi hakhu men do wa phe la ju samba ja chumbo kha ga shi da din so hakhu men do wa din de so tibet is also referred to as the third pole ra Kangri Rave Kovesh went to the heavenly abort land surrounded by snow mountain ranges a roof of the world the third pole and then the next slide will show you how many rivers originate from Tibet and flow into the neighboring countries ra teach you samala ani phegi di kheche jon di environmentally speaking also it's very important next slide <coughs> Tua, tina la, then you can see these subjects in our la, pune gangde la, then the dim indwa harsa, tune the yomar ba, okay. Then mena di gangde la river jdwa yellow river, yellow river and the Yangtze river. The two rivers are the lifelines of China. If it is not for these two rivers that originate from Tibet, should di ni ni di mebe ina. Jana nalo la mi tungur chupshi. They cannot support 1.4 billion people in China uh, without that water that originates from Tibet. And Yellow River, by the way, is also cradle to Chinese civilization. Chinese civilization is one of the oldest civilizations in this world, uh, and Chinese civilization was formed on the banks of the Yellow River. Did you do some jana la chu? The Yellow River flows in the north of China, and the Yangtze flows in the south of China. Ra, and the Jana ge chu che shu ni di pe ne yong go doa. The ke chen bo ke ge cha ge yu ma ha go doa. That then, if you come to this, the Mekong, the doa, Mekong River 
<coughs> is also one of the longest rivers in the world and it originates from Tibet, from Kham, Amdu the Khamne Ma Yunguyore. Khamne any Ma Drosa de Lumbanganal Druguyore. It flows into five different countries Laos, Burma, Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam. Lumbanganalola Mekong flows. And Mekong is the lifeline for these five countries. Then you also have the Salween. Salween, the Thailand Tang Burma border parallel Duguyare. Then you have the Irrawaddy that flows into Burma. That's Brahmaputra Dwa. Brahmaputra. The point the when it takes us that is that place where the Brahmaputra flows south. That area is called um, the the Great Bent, the Great Bent Lagure. When the Brahmaputra flows from Western Tibet, comes to Eastern Tibet, and then takes a south turn towards India, and China is building a dam that's twice the size of Three Gorges Dam, which is the biggest in the world. Three Gorges Dam, Yanaliyare. Now this dam at Pemaku is supposed to produce, it's twice the size, there, which means it's going to inundate a lot of land upstream. And it destroys the unique flora and fauna in that region. And this dam is supposed to produce three times the electricity, hydroelectricity than the Three Gorges Dam. So it's going to be the biggest dam in the world. And as I told you, the whole Himalayan region is a seismic zone. It's prone to earthquakes. If something happens to that size of a dam inside Tibet, what is going to happen to people in Arunachal Pradesh in India and into Assam and into Bangladesh? So Brahmaputra flows from Tibet into India and into Bangladesh. And then you also have another river called the Karnali. It's not marked here. There is a river called Karnali. Just last December, they came out of, with a map. They built a big dam on, on the Karnali. And the Karnali flows from Tibet into Nepal and then into India and joins the Ganges. Ganga joins Shigiyore. And then you have the Sutlej. Ganga also flows from the border of Tibet and India. And Pajo the Indus Dwa. Indus River flows from Tibet into India and then into Pakistan. Uh, the Tibetan rivers, the rivers that originate, and Indus is also the home to Indus Valley civilization. Uh, another one of the oldest civilizations in this world. So the rivers that originate from Tibet are home to two older civilizations, and then it impacts the whole area, region. Uh, some environmental scientists estimate that about out of 8 billion people in this world, 1.8 billion people have something or the other to do with rivers that originate from Tibet. And the countries that we are talking about, Pakistan, India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, Burma, and China. Ten different countries. All these countries are some of the most densely populated areas in the world. Mimbur Mangshu Tengare. Mimbur Mangshu, some people say that the Third World War could happen because of water. If that is the case, then Tibet is a huge bio hotspot. Uh, now we hear when I travel around the world, you read articles from Southeast Asia, you hear that because China is building multiple dams on the rivers that originate from Tibet. On Mekong alone, I counted about 32 dams. Then Recently, we heard about a dam being built on Yangtze, on the upper reaches of Yangtze in Kham, in Derge area. So Derge is the east side of the uh, Yangtze, and Jomda is the west side of Yangtze, Kham Gnalola. 
And that is one of the one out of the 13 dams they are planning on the upper reaches of Yangtze. And this is the sixth which they are building in Jomda and uh, Terge. Did you do? <coughs> and China does not share hydrological data with any of the downstream countries. They don't share. So nobody knows. When there is, they use Tibet's water like a water tap. Right? If there is access, they let it flow, then you have flood in the downstream countries. If there is shortage, they close it off in the dams, and then you have drought in the downstream countries. So a lot of people's livelihoods are being affected because China does not share any hydrological data, and they store Tibet's water for their own use. Right? Did you do? And all these countries that I mentioned are densely populated. That is why we are not just talking about the environmental importance of Tibet, but we are talking about serious food security. If there is no water in Thailand and all these countries, you cannot grow the rice that they eat, right? And then you are also talking about water security issues. And these are going to be very, very consequential for the whole region. You will also realize that Tibet is so big, it's 2.5 million square kilometers. So there was never ever a border between China and India, the two most populous nations in this world. There was never ever, historically, there was never ever a border, common border between India and China. Only after communist China invaded Tibet, then it became a common border between China and India. But even now, Indian government has not changed the name from Indo-Tibetan Border Force, Indo-Tibetan Border Police, and your IDPP, the IDBF, like the Otherwise, they could have changed it to Sino-Indian Border Force or Border Police. They have still kept it. That's why I say that underlies India's position on Tibet, since they have not changed the name of the border, or the border force, or the border police, right? So you can see how important Tibet is geopolitically, located between the two most populous nations in the world. Uh, so only after communist China invaded Tibet, then there was the first war, first ever war between China and India in 1962. And that really caused a lot of trouble between the Chinese and the Indians. And they could not restore diplomatic relations till about 1987 when Indian Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi went to China in 1987. It concerns not only the Tibetans, but the whole region. And the ice melt over the uh, Tibetan plateau, right? any jet streams that flow over the Tibetan plateau decides the monsoon in the region. Monsoon then rainfall. Then Samalo did you some the period the Kagus Kachimbu Imbadi on the geostrategic importance of Tibet and environmental importance of Tibet. That global significance somebody his Holiness always talks about the importance of Tibetan Buddhist culture, which is based on non-violence, ahimsa, karuna, compassion, sungudwa. So right now, in this world, we are witnessing too many conflicts, violent conflicts, starting from Ukraine to Gaza today. There are so many violence all around. And His Holiness' message of peace and non-violence has to resonate in this world. And Tibetans are perhaps the only one who are undertaking non-violent resistance right now. So we could, if the Tibetan, Sino-Tibet conflict could be resolved through non-violence, it will set an example for the rest of the world to resolve conflict through non-violence. Ah. So you can, if any of you are interested, 
you can keep this presentation. You can ask the, the Tibetan Community Center here to give you the presentations, and you can so 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 you can that the wala pheo ko la share ko chuna digesta thana ngay deshe jab 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 tu sarwa le lau doa pheo de kechum bu khas simen chiarwa thin sama dinde chini deshe jab tu ba do chima ina ani di shrim ki neju basic information to zong anjo provide chini ani pheo ko la neju shamba sotu ya di kechum bu le ta thine thana anjo di vision paper thina lama deshe jab yung jo samala anjo global significance deshe jab and the name of Pearl Tanda Kang and Karichi Yume. Pearl Nalola, Tangi, Pomijik, Chihuatanaswa, Human Rights, Yori, Yomari, Laishorwa. So if you read George Orwell's 1984, which talks about the state surveilling and controlling every citizen, that's becoming a reality in the whole of China and more so in the Tibetan region. There is no political space whatsoever. You can't do anything. Just as I said this morning, if Namjela and we are friends from school days, and if I have to talk to him, if we are meeting after 20 years, and I have to be very careful about what I speak to him because I can't trust him. He might report my views to the government, and then I could get arrest arrested, and he could be rewarded. That is the anti-espionage law, which has gone down to the grassroots. Everybody lives in fear as to who is going to report on my activities if you have a political position. You can't say long live His Holiness, you go to jail. If you say long live His Holiness Dalai Lama, you go to jail. If you have a picture of His Holiness Dalai Lama, you go to jail. There is no political space whatsoever. I, this morning also I spoke about 157 <coughs> Tibetans who self emulated themselves from 2009 to about two years ago. And most of them were from the, between the age of 16 to 35. They have never witnessed independent Tibet. They have never witnessed what happened during the Cultural Revolution when 6,000 Tibetan monasteries were destroyed. Right? Tibetan monks were deroped. People were asked to walk over the Tibetan scriptures. Under the present dispensation of Xi Jinping, he is imposing more and more control on the whole of China and more so in Tibet. religious from a religious point of view, we had monasteries with 3,300, 5,500, 7, monks in one monastery alone inside Tibet. Today, those have been reduced to 400, 500 monks. And if the monks and nuns have to travel from one place to another, they need at least four or five different permits to travel from one place to another. Right now the Chinese government, who does not believe in religion, who are atheists, wants to be responsible for setting up curriculum in the monastic studies. Management of the monasteries and nunneries have been taken over by the security agencies, multiple security agencies, and the United Front Work Department. They want to be responsible for recognizing reincarnated lamas, including the Dalai Lama. And the whole aim is aimed towards the Dalai Lama. That is why they framed a law as early as 2007 called Order Number no. 5, where the state or the government of the China will be responsible for recognition of reincarnated lamas, including the Dalai Lama. Did you do? So, His Holiness always comes out with very um, uh, interesting response to this, right? So His Holiness, if the Chinese government is really serious about reincarnation, then Chinese government should study Tibetan Buddhism first. 
because you have to believe in the concept of life after death if you believe in reincarnation, right? So, if the Chinese government is really serious, they should look for Mao Zedong's reincarnation first, because Mao Zedong died long ago, right? And Teng Xiaoping second, now maybe even Zhang Zemin, he is no more in this world. Then maybe the Dalai Lama's. That's what His Holiness, how, that's how His Holiness used to respond in a, um, in a manner that he, His Holiness does all the time, right? So, the, so these days when His Holiness keeps assuring us that he will live for another two decades or more or that His Holiness will live up to 113 years of age, there are pr 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 uh, propitious pre-signed that this Dalai Lama would live very long. And just before coming here, I attended the long life prayer to His Holiness. Then I tell our Chinese friends, this message is for you, because you guys are waiting for this third, 14th Dalai Lama to die. And His Holiness keeps assuring us that he will live for another two decades or more, up to 113 years of age. So because you are waiting for this Dalai Lama to die, right? And His Holiness keeps saying that I will live long. So I keep telling the Chinese, let us see whether the Dalai Lama outlives the Communist Party or the Communist Party outlives the Dalai Lama. I go around the world. In the last two years, I traveled to some 24 different countries uh, from Far East, from New Zealand, Australia, Japan to Europe, India, Europe, and North America, South America. For the first time, we managed to go to Brazil, uh, Colombia, and Mexico. My predecessor, Dr. Lobsan Singe, had gone to Mexico, but not beyond that. So it was a revelation for me because every visit to any country for me it's a learning experience. Brazil has no idea about what Chinese government is doing. So I told them Brazil is the Amazonia, right? So I told them the correlation between the Amazon environment and Tibet. Even though we are on two different parts of the world, there is a scientific study which talks about the influence of Amazon over the Tibetan plateau or vice versa. When there is more rainfall in the Amazon, there is less snow in Tibet. When there is more snow in Tibet, then there is less rainfall in Amazon. This scientific study in the Chesha, they looked at climatic conditions over many years and how South America, uh, then Africa to Middle East to Tibet how it relates to each other environmentally. And when I met to Mexico, in fact, Mexico's, Mexico is the biggest trading partner for Mexico is U.S. But they hate the U.S. so much because of immigration program, problems and border problems and all that. Right? That's why they go to China and they do trade with China. Now, China has become the second largest trading partner of Mexico. So I was telling the Mexico, because they don't have a clue about what the Chinese government is doing. Right? So it's very important for Mexicans to understand what the Chinese government is doing around the world, not just to Tibet and East Turkestan and Hong Kong and all that. I asked them to form think tanks to study China because when you deal with China, nothing comes for free. There is no free lunch. It comes with a strategy. China always comes with a strategy. So now how they do that is when they reach out to global south, that is Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia and all that, global south, they get vote at the multilateral forums like United Nations. So if you have heard about the universal periodic review on the human rights condition in China, many countries supported China because they are doing business with China, even though 
there is a lot of human rights violation in China, including in the Tibetan region. Right? But these countries are not able to speak up because China puts pressure on them to vote for, in favor of them, not against them. And that's how China uses its leverage, business, economic leverage for political gains. So Mexico it's very strong, it's dictatorial, you know, power coming down to the bottom. It's not like that in totality. Because China also has a lot of chinks in their, harm, in their armor. China might look strong, but it's not as strong as you see it. So I explained to them about the vulnerabilities of China. They have political might, they have economic might, and all this political might and military might is coming out of the economic might, right? Because they are doing a lot of business with outside world, and they have the money. Till about one year ago, they were saying $3.6 trillion worth of foreign exchange reserve. So I explained to the Mexicans as to what China is doing around the world with their Belt and Road Initiative. So they are building roads, they are building railways, they are building airports, they are building ports, seaports in many parts of the world. China is building that. They are investing money, they are sending their engineers, their own people. They are not employing people from Mexico to build the metro in Mexico. They are bringing all Chinese laborers, Chinese technology, and then create debt. So if I have to give you a small example, maybe next time I'll have better maps to explain all this. So now China is claiming its sovereignty over the whole of South China Sea. And that is why China has problems with Japan. That's on the Senkaku Islands. That's why China has problems with Taiwan, of course. Taiwan-China relations is another matter, but then they have problems on Daewoo Islands. Then with the Philippines on the Spratlys Island. So China has problem with all the countries in Southeast Asia because they came out uh, with a map claiming all these territories as their own. And just recently, if you read newspapers, they started renaming places in Arunachal Pradesh, which is part of India, with Chinese names. China has started calling Tibet as Shizang, which is the Chinese word for Tibet. Uh, and it has a lot of political connotations as well, political sovereignty, territorial, everything as well. So now if you look at the world map, if you are good in geography, coming from, from South China Sea, then you have this Malacca Strait which is the main seafare Tuzinzo Pasu Drosag Langadere, Malacca Strait. The name Tsu Yombaina, Cambodia is almost 40% in debt with China. That is why they have taken over. Now, when Cambodia cannot repay the loans, they are taking over, they have taken over part of the Sihanouk Wheel port in Cambodia. And they have also taken over another place where they could land military planes. And many years ago, Burma offered China Cocoa Islands. So co from Cocoa Islands, you can watch the whole of Bay of Bengal, which is a huge security threat to India. Now they build an airport and a port in Sri Lanka, a seaport, and there's no traffic as they expected. So when there's no traffic, there's no revenue, and you cannot pay back the loans to China. So China has taken over the seaport called the Hambantota port. Now, if you look at, if you read newspapers these days, Maldives, a small place with many islands, a new president had come there and they decided to have better relations with China and force all the Indian army out of Maldives. By May 10th, all the Indian army has to go. 
su ropa ne kaga mangmi sama khojo gita pigi yar ani gwadar port pakistan ma which is a very very strategic location ra dinde chinta pakistan iran djibouti djibouti they have a, they have occupied a huge space where they can land or their fighting air, fighter planes tochin jag ta jana khawa khasala they are extending their arms and legs ta dezu tenga the chinese design the goma so now today china is talking about exporting their system of governance global 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 tenga global security initiative global economic initiative global civilizational initiative ta tanda canada na lola tanda ngadu drung mangbo khugudu just few days back we met some people they are talking about a lot of incursions from chinese into canada because canada does not have a law like the foreign agents regulation act in united states in united states if you have a non governmental organization representing another principal party then you need to report all your activities and accounts to the united states government which is again the section of the government called the department of justice in canada you don't have to report to anybody so chinese come in because the can jami gi chongwan do nge man chik dong gup je ngap chu thuk chu nang no ne de canada na jaw pe shuk shum bior so i would recommend for you to read this book called the hidden hand written by dr america allbuck and dr clive hamilton from australia khonju din an lobe ne you will understand the structure as to how it's built inside china and how they try to influence the world different countries i was in new zealand i was in australia they first experimented dealing with the west in new zealand and australia and then they transplanted those theories into europe into north america and other countries this is some china has a big design around the world now would you as canadian tibetans like to be ruled by chinese in the days to come nobody wants that right so today when i travel to europe Uh, uh our friends in the parliament and some some of them say oh the dragon is biting at us dragon meaning china then i tell them who fed the dragon to make it so strong to be able to bite at you it's the united states it's europe it's japan it's taiwan who put in lot of investment in china and made china big created we created this monster for china now knowing that china is biting at you if you still want to feed the dragon then whose fault is it then you consult nie kon da guyo ani gami le khanan so kau tau le kon so you bent your body to show your respect to the chinese imperials now you are on your two legs right if you kau tau too much your hands will also become legs then i tell them you will become donkeys china will keep riding you so when i ask my friends what is the take away from all my talks they say we don't want to be donkey so tell the canadian government also whether they want to be donkey or not but they do not love go shung so so la pa la do samba la ngazo de shi gap na manda 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 de shi gap che and now people are willing to listen to us because we understand china better than the europeans you know, or the canadians or the americans in some we have a lot of things to say and that's how we try to reach out there are so many things i can say but i think let's make it a little interactive and can't you what in the you know i need to all the link up chain and kind of show it's done was it useful pen to chung pen to so ni khoe do jire do yeah and to way in the chik chik bol ya ni ma chik la mang bu shu xie xie ne ke zo go bue che de ne ma yan tun ju ka bu cha ge wa ari to xie xie bu che then you read these books history books tibet brief 2020 by michael van balt van prak and there's another book by professor lao in chinese and the english translation will come out in the next two months okay Um, 
Mr. Si Kyung, uh, I have a question about um, about how you know the Tibetan uh, government in exile always says that their goal is either in independence or a middle way path. I'm curious on how you plan on achieving that. Good question. Now, since we came into the government on May 27, 2021. We have to follow the middle way policy because that is the official policy of the Tibetan government in exile. Okay, and this is laid where we have we went through a process of referendum first, but we didn't have to conduct the referendum before the referendum. We organized an opinion poll where the majority of the Tibetans say that we will follow whatever His Holiness decides. So in 1997, the parliament passed a unanimous resolution regarding that, that whatever His Holiness decides, based on the international situation, based on the situation inside China, and based on situation in Tibet, whatever decision His Holiness takes, we will follow that. So His Holiness reiterated that he will persist with the middle way policy. Now when you say middle way, it's a Buddhist concept. Right? So there is a middle. So when you say middle, you have two extremes. So the one extreme is the historical status of Tibet as an independent state. And the other extreme is the present situation of Tibet under the repressive Chinese Communist government. So we are trying to find a middle way which is more akin to autonomy. So the autonomy also, there are so many different kinds of autonomous arrangements around the world which is not the same. One autonomous arrangement is not the same as another. So here in Canada also you see Quebec as an autonomous state. You see Nunavut also as an autonomous state. But those two are different. Even in Canada you have asymmetrical autonomy, not symmetrical. Right? That do you do? Now, officially, we follow the middle way. And what this 16th cabinet, which I lead right now, decided is to change the strategy. Policy is same, middle way, right? When you talk about the middle, if you don't have this extreme, if there is no recognition for the historical status, then there's no middle way, because you're removing one extreme. Because then it has to be another middle, right? The Hindu Sambalam, we need to focus on the historical status of Tibet. Right? So that is why we are able to bring both independence advocates and middle advocates together. So even independent advocates, to seek independence in future, you have to prove the independent status of Tibet in the past, right? So for middle way also, we are focusing on the historical status to gain leverage for the middle way. So that's why I keep telling governments that if you keep repeating this statement that Tibet is part of PRC, then you are going against international law. Because whether it's happening to Ukraine today or whether it happened to Tibet 70 plus years ago, it was the same international law after the formation of United Nations. Right? So use of force or aggression to invade another place is not allowed in international law. So Tibet was also aggressively invaded by the Chinese, so it should be null and void under international law. One thing. Then I carry these two books, today I don't have that, Michael's book and Lao's book, because Michael Van Walt Van Prague has written this book called Tibet Brief 2020. Please read that book, right, if you want to understand Tibet. And he looks at it from a legal perspective, because he's an expert on international law. And he worked with some hundred scholars from around inner Asia, surrounding Tibet not just looking at Tibetan history or Chinese history, but he worked with some hundred scholars from inner Asia and came out with this book saying that whether it's Tibet-Mongol relation, Tibet-Ming relation, Tibet-Qing relation, or as per international law today, 
Tibet has never been considered part of China. Now there is another Chinese professor called Professor Lao. When he was young, when he was going through his university days, he was always intrigued by this question as to why Chinese government is asking every government to say Tibet is part of PRC if Tibet had already been part of China. Even as a Chinese, he started thinking about this. And after he finished his uh, professorship, he retired. And then he looked at imperial Chinese historical records published by the Communist Party on their website. And he downloaded all those documents. And now he has come up with a book that argues against the Chinese government that they, if you consider the Manchus and the Mongols also as Chinese, because there are a lot of academic discourses as to who is the real Chinese. Are the Mongols Chinese? Tibetans Chinese? Manchus Chinese? If the Mongols are Chinese, then they can claim half of the world because Genghis Khan invaded that much or Kublai Khan invaded that much of the world, right? So, Lao, Professor Lao proves that according to imperial Chinese historical records, imperial China has never considered Tibet as part of China. It's a very powerful argument coming from a Chinese based on imperial Chinese historical records. So these two are the weapons I carry with me to give it to the foreign officers and tell them, read these books, then make your statement. Don't parrot what Chinese government wants you to say that Tibet is part of PRC, Tibet is part of PRC. And the second thing we pointed out to them is, on the one hand, you keep saying Tibet is part of PRC, and then on the other hand, they keep saying, oh, we support negotiation between the Chinese government and the representatives of His Holiness Dalai Lama. And we tell them these two don't go together. It contradicts each other. Because China rules Tibet with an iron hand, right? And the whole international community keeps saying Tibet is part of China, Tibet is part of PRC. Then where is the reason for China to come and talk to us? And the third point we tell them is, why do you think Chinese government is asking other governments to say Tibet is part of PRC? Why they are not asking other governments to say East Turkestan is part of PRC, is Mongolia is part of PRC, or Manchuria is part of PRC? Why only Tibet? Because the Chinese government knows that they have no legitimacy of their rule over Tibet. And they are trying to seek that legitimacy from the international community. So I, had, I keep saying I have four reasons why we focus on historical status of Tibet. One is to send a clear message to Chinese government that you cannot distort history. Because history is history. It should be studied by historians and they should decide what Tibet's status was. Right? And the second is to send a message to the international community that you cannot parrot just Chinese government wants you to say. You have to look at the reality of history and then make a statement. And the third reason is for you all. If we Tibetans don't study Tibetan history, who else will study Tibetan history? It should be somebody who really supports Tibet a lot of interest on Tibet, or you should be a historian studying Tibetan history or the region's history. Otherwise, you will not read Tibetan history. Right? You go back home and ask your parents how much do they know about Tibetan history. Now, if the parents don't know, they cannot pass on that legacy to the child. And if you don't know, what will you say to your own children in future about Tibetan history? Then Tibetan history will get lost in the wilderness. 
But then again, you have to look at the practicality of whether that is achievable or not under the present circumstances. Whether you follow middle way or independence, till that stage to prove the historical status of Tibet as an independent state, to gain leverage for middle way, you have to talk about history. And there has to be a lot of causes and conditions to, to, for us to achieve something. So the Hindu, our strategy is to bring all the Tibetans together whether you are independence advocate or that is why we created this platform called VTAC, Voluntary Tibet Advocacy Group. I urge you to join this group. Whether you are independent seeker or middle way, it doesn't matter. Right? When you go speak to politicians, when you speak to the m media, when you speak to think tanks, right? did you Thangbo? Official position, the Deshikyap what middle way is all about, how His Holiness came to this decision, and what, are, what could be the consequences of this policy. And then you can say, I personally want independence for Tibet. Or Tibetan Youth Congress personally wants independence for Tibet. Doesn't matter. There's no conflict. As long as the messaging is clear, that there's no conflict in messaging, it's okay. This is a rather longish, because this is an uh, important question which you need to understand because some people feel okay Sorry, I lost my voice. It's okay. Um, my question is kind of general general um but since tibetan youth we are like the future generation and the leaders of tibet what is your like vision and your like kind of wish for how our rela future relationship with the people of tibet and with china are hmm. <laughs> They are aiming at destroying the identity of the Tibetans, including language. You must have heard about the colonial style boarding schools in Tibet, which is very not exactly the same as the uh, residential schools in for the First Nation people here, but it's very similar, aimed at destroying the identity of the Tibetans. So now in these colonial style boarding schools, they give education in Chinese medium. So you have only four classes on Tibetan in one week, you know, only four hours in one week. And how much can you learn? So the rules say that the, in the nationality regions, the nationality language should be the prime language. But the rules say something and they do something different. How do we preserve our identity? They are doing everything possible to counter that. 
Right? Even tuition classes are not allowed to, to, to be undertaken in Tibetan language during the weekends. Your age, your generation inside Tibet, uh, it has a lot of other implications, geopolitical security issues for India and all that. But for us as Tibetans, when we travel around the world, I make it a point to meet with the younger generation to tell you how important the Tibetan language is and why you need to study the Tibetan language. This is a reward for the language. The language is a generation of the language. The language is a generation of Mexican Gionje Pebe Genki Marwa. Canadian Chihone Pebe Genki Wanga to Peba Rang Pebe Genki or Ratindu Nazugi, Shunge Solea, Nizu Tea, and in Nizu Gosuebe Tone, any involved Chani, Sosugi Din and Lola, Zuni, that under Shudu Lingunza, we tag that the Zona, you know what to speak to politicians, you know what to speak to media, you know what to speak to think tanks. Then you do some of the capacity building thing on the Shukchumbu Sotuna. And if the Sino Tibet conflict is not resolved immediately, if you look at the policies of Xi Jinping today, it doesn't look very likely that there would be a resolution very soon. But at the same time, we are dealing with the Chinese unofficially. Okay? But what is important is for the diaspora Tibetan community to stay together, even though we are becoming physically distant. We should be emotionally closer. Right? And Dharamsala is too far away from his, you have to travel half the world. But still, even though we are physically becoming distant, we have to be emotionally close. So if they want to get involved, they have to understand what is going on inside Tibet. They have to understand. That's why I keep reading every night some six, seven, eight articles on China, on Tibet, on international politics that impacts Tibet. As long as you are informed, you are on top of things, then you can talk to people with confidence. Right? Sometimes we believe that, oh, we are too diffident. We think, oh, we, are, we don't know that much. You know? But now I know that I know much more better than many others around the world about Tibet and China that I can tell them what is exactly happening in China or Tibet. Uh, and people are willing to listen. Uh, people are willing to learn from us. Uh, and we should take this opportunity for if you all are informed, well informed about Tibet, then you all become advocates for Tibet. So it's not just only us, myself or Namgela or the Tibetan Association, then every single one of you become ambassadors for Tibetans inside Tibet. And that's how, what we should work for. And you will become more and more confident. I can stand with any leader in this world, shoulder to shoulder, and speak. Because I know the things, what I'm talking about. If you don't know, then you feel diffident. Confidence. Because they are not informed about the immediate things that has been happening in Tibet. We are the ones who have this information. And that's how we need to reach out to the world and tell them exactly what's happening and what we want them to do for us. That's why <clears throat> even on this issue of independence middle way, focusing on the historical status just by talking the talk is not enough. But we have to walk the talk. That is why Konamgela has been working along with ICT in, in Washington DC with the US Congress over the last one and a half years. Uh, and we managed to now pass this bill in the House with a super majority of 393 members out of 431 members in the house. Now we have reached halfway. The very reason for me to be here in Toronto today is 
to be in Washington, D.C. on 16th, 15th and 16th to push this bill in the Senate. Once that gets passed in the Senate, first you have to go through the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and then once the Senate Foreign Relations Committee takes a decision, then it goes to the Senate floor. So it's two, two more steps. So if it gets passed in the Senate floor, then it has to go to the President for his accent. Then it becomes a law. So once it becomes a law in the United States, last November, uh, Kohan Amjala and myself and uh, CDC Executive Director Sherab Tharchi, we were all in Ottawa, and we met in two days, we met some 26, 28 members of parliament and four ministers in Ottawa. And I told them, once this bill gets passed in the United States, we are going to come here to push this. Uh, and when we push it here, then we all have to work together. Every single person's effort makes a difference. Okay. Yeah. Pegechik do something. Sorry, Pegechik do. How much is it? Last. Oh, so the cash is do. Then you go to the cash and you can't. La what you mean? Yeah. You go to the cash. Choose a cash. Choose a cash. Choose a Lunch break, choose a cajun and cajubar. Tangur in Niberre. Kala Nanzu choose Chagan and Sana Digri. Kala Nimotaka Sagoro. Nanzu Kedisha, Nimotaka Share Ragmindua. So we'll have half an hour. Okay, ask those questions. Can't hear me. Okay. Yep, Homo. Nanga Kedja Madiche, Del Tigayunga. Tangolo, you mean Dinin Sasani? So my question is, um, I know our government and your campaign before um, promoted the middle way, right? But when you go to int uh, when, uh, when you go internationally to talk to government um, government officials, do you expect them to follow the middle way as well? And if not, or if so, how do you expect them to support um, our Tibetan purpose? Mm. That would be my question. Thank you. So there are two things I always say. When it comes to Sino-Tibet conflict, the resolution can come only by dealing with China. United States cannot give autonomy to the Tibetans. You can't expect NATO to interfere, you know, to seek a resolution for Tibet. So the only way is to deal with the Chinese government. Now, till such a time that we are able to seek a resolution dealing with the Chinese, we have to reach out to the international community. There's no choice. Right? When we reach out to the international community, we also have to bear one fact in mind that everybody is concerned about their national interests. Jacob Suine, Susu, Kevin Tamutagri, Madoji, Jacob Shamba Kevin Tagumarwa, Pebaline, O Pebanzo Ningjes, and Dijiku Tagumane. First is national interest. Now, the thing is, how do we align our interests with that country's interests? So, when the aligning, alignment of the interests comes together, then it produces better result. So, when we reach out to the Canadian government also, we have to tell them how it benefits the t Canadian government in terms of how we are advocating and what we are telling them. When we reach out to the Americans, we have to tell them how it's important for their national security supporting the Tibetan issue. And when it comes to India also, it's the same thing. Because right now, India has problem with China because China's belligerence on the Indian border is giving a lot of problem for the Indians, right? So we have to align, when we speak to governments, we have to align our interests with their interests to seek their interests and support. And that's how we need to reach out. Right. That's a bit short answer. Of course, we can speak longer, but there's no time. So next question. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Sikyong, uh, my question has 
Uh, Mr. Si Kiong, my question has to do with uh, the Tibetans living in Sichuan and Qinghai. The Chinese claim over Tibet says that Tibet has been part of China since the Yuan Dynasty, and in my opinion, that is not true. Central Tibet and Utsang was not part of uh, China ever. However, the Tibetan areas of Qinghai and Sichuan have been under Chinese rule since at least the Yuan Dynasty. So. How does the Tibetan government in exile justify its claim over the Tibetan areas in Qinghai and Sichuan? Throughout history, every nation has its relation with neighboring countries. There have been incursions, there have been wars between neighboring countries. And the same thing happened with Chinese and Tibet. Right. When the Manchus started coming into Tibet, that was in 1720s. And that is when Qinghai and the Sichuan, part the east of Tishu River, became, in a way, separate, not under the Gandhian government or the central Uzang government. Right? So they became separate. But that also does not necessarily mean to say that they came under Chinese influence because they were autonomously managed by Tibetans. Qinghai was Amdo region, right? Including Nangcheng today. Kamgi Nangcheng Zoyin and Qinghai Na Yore. Any Amdo Gangzang, Qinghai Na Yore. In a Dinamola, Pyunzog Simde Yorwa. They may be paying some tax to the Chinese authorities, but administration is done essentially by the Tibetans. Then again you have this parallel of the local chieftains and the lamas. Right? And when it comes to the grassroots administration of these bodies, if you compare the chieftains and the lamas, lamas are more powerful. And all these lamas are linked to the central monastery in central Tibet. Ula, Udan, Sangla, Yugo, Saja in a Kaju in a Ningma in a Gilu in a Tangutarsa, the Uni Taroa. Then it went to other periods. So, this is parallel to the Sangmayor, but just because those areas were not part of Kandemporan government for some time does not necessarily mean to say that they are not Tibetans. Because the Chinese law says that if it's a people who live in contiguous territory with the same culture and language, they are the same people, right? Again, history now, in mid-18th century, East India Company came to India. They invaded India. But in 1947, 200, 250 years later, India became independent. That does not mean to say that เจ็บๆจะอาดีอินจิกวอลยาเงมานเอลฮาร์สติลับชิงวอลวาเพิกสกุกะเชกะนากวอลเอชุกเกงวอลเทวายอเรกับจิกละกันเดพรังวอลย
ani nga tsungu ni chapchu ta chapchu refugee changna lungu ta ta lu ni tukchi ri nga sdugu yore ta ta na poko na pe musikanga ri yore ani khala gurla na ani nga tsungu ma jarum puchi to tsenshu pu jang ga long shok rongzi ra ta ta na jarum puchi ga gong zhi a tsu yi bjo nor ga jia chi tong za ba ni pin hu mi lam ga ta nga tsugu tsenshu pu jang ga long shok de hu mi lam yin di zan ba la ani hu mi lam ga ta ni khala gurli Danda nyimong puchi ke gumi lam zina ani nanga dede yaris ani ji ki kalau gari ji ki jawa rumbu che dong ani ji ki sichong po jang da dende zi ji ki jaga gari ji ani gumi lam ki takni ani ji ki shalak la jami la cha sumu zoe yo maris ji ki kalau jami la be da kalau gari li ingir dende pe ba yana te ji ki ki yo maris dende zun da ngalan do kwa yin sina ngal ingir pe na ji ki mati pchak ji gari te ngarong po pas yin be chani ngarong lang gen yo re te ndi zan bala ngarong yin na ngarong gi drau ngu sum be takni Ani salah kerja bah turun turun jangan orang zaman kau la siwi kau ni jauh rumput si gongjer yang orang longsor tak orang ki dah ubo la rongan tu, bukan orang dah jauh rumput si gongjer. Kau ini sena ni siwi ni tu siwi jima tu siap juzat tu jauh ibu jenar cak dia orang. Tengok zaman bala ani orang ki titah ni si simbala dengar si mampu si orang dengar la dia tu. Ani Nga tanda balok la lingki pen da ani ngarongi pala mala da ama mela kaku zuri pala nya koji chap zuri ngarongi na tanda pokon amdo ngawa zurgi nire ani tanda ina talu nyitong nyishit sabji ga jeda nyipa ge poko losar ke tere jela ani ngi ama ngala kantrum vichadu nolok la dira raksan ra ani ngatsu nolok la nyentak pa antenda lesans ani Chirongi Pogu De Shijia Langba La Yore Ani Chirongi Pogu De Ga Ani Kharzina Gatu Pola Leya Ghe Kuron Lan Dupa Yuna Ani Nga Su Ghe Nien Tak Pao Police Office Ghe Fantang Asya Da Ani Visa Che Go Tindra Nga Ama Ghe Lap Sang Ani Kuron Su Ghe Nga La Nga Su Blanket Ji Yora Tindra Ji Tres Sang Lap Sang Ama Ghe Kharzina Chirong Pogu La Lu Sarpa La Da Ji Nien Pa Do Zina Ji Tindra No Lap Kandu Ra Ani Kharzong Jidda Sumpa Ghe Tere chewa jie na jila ni ngay pala ka amala lam na da ngala kalab gore di Kongtu ki pala ra anja lab sha churong ki bhuga di Shijia lang pala Ani ka sakpa dinda tsung na ngu tsun na da ni likha yakpo chaya ka mendoos Tere di jambala ani di la kalab gore Ani di la kongtu la ngala lab Tere lab sha ani nomi la yena da di si ji kanga do tre dek do ra Yena da di chetong ka da ngay di churong Pumi saya cek dah sejam yang bicara ni, cakap si tuan dewa itu betul ni orang kita dengar cerita ni terus tu. Ani yang baju kerela ni ngah tu ke ngah tu sama cakap cerita ni. Ani ngah tu sama lah tu. Pukul nang asih kangar yore, rongong gugur yore, pukul nang dua meter tu orang gugur yore. Tapi yang di zaman lah pukul nang tanda ni tuan di dige dige cakap dia yore. Tapi yang di zaman lah ni tanda yang ni tuan ni sabi ke jeda ni pak sebab teri cingi lah. Ani am tu ngah. Chongchi ni puk jiwa Ani kurong ya jik jam Kurong ya na jik jik tomre Ani kurong ya jik nolak la Da tuwa kare la na Jarkab mesa ke jarkab chik nolak la Ngutu tsangma Zima reis Ani taka no chik Ngatsu pu murik zujun di Janak muk nolak la Mpun nong shi reis Da dindra jini kurong ya jik Tomna kurong jeda Dik jeda sempa ke tari chik ni ni kurong Tak jamie gue nyentak bagi kurang sana jiksha yore ta, tindra jine kangar yore. Tapi masih tanda yang cah ni mak hasil zikna la. Am do ngawa kiri gumba la, ani trawa kurang mana pema, ani kurang ke jawa rumbu cingo, darpan cikir na, ani ngatu trawa jana la, siwi lingke pena kurang yang tanda kangar jiksha yore. Tindra gue kangar jiksha dia yore. Tapi ni zaman la ngatu ke rongol lomba ke di nolak la, cik sabat tindra mampu cik cik dia gitu, ani sabat cik na ni Jika kalau tu, papa ke nongker lah jika kalau tu ni doh cina. Jika ni ke ngasuk ke sapa tu, na jarkap tu murid dah ngasuk ke capture yang dia ngasuk lang genten yara. Jauh rumput itu anda rumput pola dendri si gore pola ni ke dirce ke ni macam syar gugu yana. Dendri ke gong ni ngasuk lingkir kasih mangga penna. Ani tejik penyar eh dendri sanggup dah ngasuk ke lingkir sapa mampu tu na ke tin sapa dia ke papa ke nolak lah jik 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 tumbu Tumbuh no cahaya ke dendra ke nyengkan cingi ngarong ini dendra cing tong dek do ani jempa yang jengjeng main pun sapa ngas yora 
Tinolo Yamyon <laughs> Tandar <laughs> Tanda and Tandayanchashi, uh, first of all, I just want to say uh, I thought your talk was really insightful, um, and I want to say thank you for that. Uh, uh, this is relating to what you were saying about um, us feeding the dragon uh, as like mm -hmm. a Western culture. Um, I was curious, how do we, fr um, from a Western perspective, move away from our dependence on China's economy? Um, that we depend on so heavily for like um, the cheapest phones, all the iPhones are made there. Um, everyone I know that's my age uh, has ordered something from Amazon or Timu or whatnot. Um, one strategy I can think of off the top of my head is like raising taxes or tariffs. Mm. But um, the problem with this is that they're still getting our business and uh, the dependency is still there. Uh, are there any alternatives that you can see to this problem? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The ones who don't understand middle way or who want to discourage middle way, they speak about those things that, oh, if you follow middle way, Chizang, 
Tanang Anzuki Kasha Degi, we use our mind to explore how do we gain leverage for middle way. So it's not like, you know, if you follow middle way, you just stay at home and don't do anything, don't do any protest, don't go to the Chinese embassy. Tikka ja mare. Omega Tony ne lingupe a mango yore, in a cousin labanashin, Ganan Shongzo Chimba in a gather than so madam matangs. If you burn Chinese flag, the Chinese government use it to tell the Chinese people that the Tibetans are burning the national flag of PRC, which again, we create more enemies. Jamigi, Semnal, or Pavatika, the Petuk Jarashale, Samlo de Konsu Sojuku Yarwa. That didn't so much ever share. You do it in a right way, send the ma- message across, right? Can I show up doing a game with Chinese degree, need to shine a degree, in a doshueta? That would hurt the sentiment of millions of Chinese and then we create more enemies instead of supporters. And then we create more enemies instead of supporters. I was not sure whether that the live to the Yoruba. We do live to Yoruba. Live to the Koran Sundu, some of the Koran and the Pernano, Nezu Sundu, dear Konsuta de Urda. Wherever I go, the Chinese government is watching all the time. As I speak now, they are listening because all of all are going live. He, he got up and he came here. They are watching everything, wherever we go, whatever we are speaking about, they are always listening. So this is another form of reversal of transnational repression. Because the Tibetans who are outside here, they try to put pressure by saying, if you, don't, if you go and protest, then you will not get visa to go to Tibet. That's the ultimate weapon of the Chinese government, not to grant visa right, to go to Tibet. <coughs> And the Chinese government always tried to entice people to come in to Tibet, influence them, pay money or use influence, give them visa, do something so that these people will turn around and then be favorable to, to the Chinese government. That is their expectation. But we know that this doesn't work with everybody. But there are Tibetans within the Tibetan community who loves money. Pesha Kata Church any Ganan Shungu Kubla Juting and then a Yunguyare. So not all Tibetans are same, right? Then you do some Pur Manchaji, same shoe yore, Kamigi Shugen Wala Druguyo Mare, and Tanda Purnal Sheba Disuna de Ine de Ta Purnal Lokashe Mwene, we know. Nazu Haku Ware. Purla Nangmi Yugo and the Chige la Pinga Yuna Puguyuna could you address someone lengi or they try to get address of every Tibetan who is living outside Tibet, who are related to Tibetans inside Tibet. Then they tell the relatives inside that if you don't ask your son or daughter or your brother, sister, whoever that is, in the foreign countries, not to be active. Active Chebaina, you guys inside Tibet are going to suffer. That's how they use, you know, the the uh, reversal of transnational repression. The Chigi are it. The Tanakurang Sumba Dembare, Nazuha Kugori, and Shetang Pugudigeta, Pud the Bunashin Sigiris. The double jury, Kanagi, when it comes to United States, they always say, Oh, United States is not treating us equal. But when it comes to Canada, does the Chinese government treat Canada as equal? Never. With, even with India, they don't consider India as equal. So, although everybody is an independent country by themselves whether you are big or small, and China never does that. One important thing that you spoke about, there are too many organizations now in exile uh, in the diaspora community, and all these are becoming divisive in many cases, not doing the things that they should be doing, not focusing on what they need to do, but doing other things that creates more problem within the community, whether it's to do with regionalism or religious factors or whatever. So you young people need not uh, 
lo shoma do digan le samutang o mare na choka chulu len do samalo just leave it aside so a spiritualism is up to the individual as to what you want to do it cannot be forced on anybody right whether you follow this particular tradition or that particular tradition it should not become a point of conflict right ani choka yemba ine kari we don't have even a handful of soil in our hand or land in our hand. And What do we fight for? No. First we have to seek a resolution. And when we get to go back to Tibet, then we can talk about other things. Even me as a Sikong right now, when I think about possible solutions for Tibet, I think about all the three provinces, not just one province. That's why I also say, since we came into exile, this 14th Dalai Lama, managed to create an identity of Tibetan national identity of all the three provinces together, despite the question that came from the other gentleman who asked the second question, which is very relevant also historically to understand our perspectives. That is why I keep saying you have to go back to history and understand all those things. So these organizations, whatever is coming up, should not be a cause of divisiveness. They should be focusing more on what they need to do for the common cause of Tibet. Right. So all we are trying to do is to create a common uh, curriculum for all the schools under TCV or homes or some border, but uh, the one that you're dealing with, I'm not sure whether it's there in the because you're talking about eight to current nine to fourteen years old. Tenzo the Tuji Greek swans with Tangadi, Nazo Pegel, Tanda Yagana, Tendeji, Ayuna, Sangodo. But if it's not there, if these are some things that need to be introduced which are useful for the Tibetan young Tibetans, we can always think about all this and you can also, you know, maybe we can. Uh, uh, there would be time when the education minister can come here. All the recommendations that the, um, the, the principal gave this morning, also I'm going to forward to the education department and I'll add your suggestion also in that. The name, feeding the dragon, ki cordela, the dependence on Chinese economy. Now all we are saying is, what the Biden administration is doing right now is very strategic. You know, because what they feel as as a competition coming from China on space technology, on uh, high-end microchips, or uh, quantum computing, all these areas, military, you know, hardware and software, all these things. China is able to spend on all these things because of the foreign exchange they have. That's why I talked about the $3.6 trillion worth of foreign exchange reserve they have, which they were talking about a year ago, but now they don't come out with the numbers because it's for sure that the number is depleting. So U.S. strategy, not just cutting China off from these high-end products, because even as we speak, I think the U.S. delegates are going to Netherlands to speak with the Netherlands governments not to service the missionaries, the lithograph missionaries that they supply to the uh, Chinese government, which they have already supplied, of course, in future, U.S. is already working with Netherlands and Japan and South Korea because these are the four countries that has this specialty in supplying missionaries to produce high-end microchips, right? So all these things are going on. So now the trade imbalance between United States and China, that is what United States government is trying to control, the trade imbalance. And I spoke about the trade imbalance between China and the European Union yesterday or this morning, I forgot. But the, the whole 27 nations of European Union are s exporting only 200 billion US dollar worth of goods and services to China. 
and China is exporting 600 billion to the European Union. So every year you're talking about 400 billion trade deficit between the European Union and China. So with all these trade deficit, China gains in terms of foreign exchange and then they splurge it on Belt and Road Initiative, curating all these dead economies, spending it on space technology, robotics, quantum computing, everything. And we are actually facilitating them by giving them more business. So my contention is when I, when I speak to the Europeans, I tell them we follow non-violence. Now if you supply ammunitions to Ukraine, then the only way is they have to fight if you have weapons. So you either kill the Russians or the Russians kill you, which is violent in any way, both sides, both sides will anyway lose, right? What we are suggesting is that if you have to follow a non-violent means of so containing China, give them less business. Then they won't have this foreign exchange reserve to splurge it on all those things, plus buying all from Russia. So I tell the Europeans, you are indirectly sustaining the war in Ukraine by giving too much business to China and China buys oil from Russia and Russia gets this income to sustain the war in Ukraine. And that is the best way to deal in a non-violent way. That's our suggestion. So if you reduce the trade imbalance, then China will not have that extra money to splurge it, right, to spend it. And that is what I feel is a good non-violence way of doing things. So, of course, dependency. Dependency depends on how much cheap products you are getting. And I also focused on China trying to reach out to the global south. Now, the problem is how much capacity does the global south in terms of purchasing power compared to the United States or Europe? They don't have. So, China has splurged extra production of, of so many goods and now they have no market to sell so they are selling it to the global south in the poor countries in Latin America and Africa the reason why their export went up to 8.7 percent last month was because there was an increase of more than 20 percent export to Latin America and Africa and 12 percent increase to India that's why the average went up but if, you f if Chinese government floods all these global south countries with their cheap products, it's going to kill all their small-scale industries. Because they, would be, they won't be able to compete with the prices that are coming for the goods that are coming from China. Only then will they realize that they are in deep trouble. So we have to start speaking about it now. Then they know, because you don't need omniscience. Because the omare. You just need your intelligence to work out how this is going to shape up in the next few years, right? And if you keep telling them now, then they will say, oh, the Tibetans have been saying this for a long time and we didn't listen to them, right? And these are very simple economics. You don't need rocket science to understand all this, right? And even Canada has, except for a few countries like Japan, Taiwan, New Zealand, Australia, most of the countries have trade deficit with China. And that is where we have to hit. Okay. To China, that's how long to go to it. Thank you, Sik Kyung La. Um, to conclude our talk, I'd like to invite Yi Shila, who is the fundraiser coordinator, uh, to deliver the final notes. To China, I am the to China Mashunila, and the Sigulagi Kalamna on the Naragi Sam Sawajirwa, or the Nagungalagi. If we don't study Tibetan history, who else will study it? Roa, the Jigsun Roa, the Semla Subuchun So. Animdo Danda Gongolagi presentation Nangdu Dinala Mozugi geopolitically how significant Tibet is. Then Mozugi D Roa presentation the Mozu Kanchun Dilling office in Lenny Degree, everyone should have it. Roa Ani Sigun Pembatsarin La, we extend our deepest gratitude for sharing your wisdom and experience with us today. 
Your words have resonated deeply with our youth, igniting a passion for positive action and inspiring us to be the change we wish to see in the world. Thank you very much, Sejun Pepatrinlao. It's lunchtime now. As we leave, can you guys please uh, stack up the chairs for us, please? Thank you.